Okay, so uh, welcome to the um, our, our second Center of Taiwan Studies uh, seminar uh, of today. I'm delighted to welcome back uh, Professor Shelley Rieger from Davidson uh, College. Um, Shelley's a regular visitor um, to Europe, but also to uh, to SOAS. She was just here uh, almost exactly a year ago for the uh, the World Congress. Um, um, Shelley uh, is probably one of the most influential uh, writers on uh, Taiwan politics. Um, many of us know her through her work, for example, Why Taiwan uh, Matters, um, uh, because of her, her book about the, the, uh, uh, the DUP. Um, and today she's going to be talking about uh, her first book, uh, Politics uh, in Taiwan, Voting for uh, Democracy. Um, Shelley did ask me, is, uh, will anyone have read this book in the in the audience? Because of course this book came out in 1999, and I'm glad to see um, quite a few people from my uh, who's taking my Taiwan politics class. One, two, three, four, um, uh, five, and actually quite a few people have uh, were in my class uh, a number of, of years ago. Charles must be ten years ago. Not quite. Okay, it's, 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 uh, uh, Jason is about um, four years ago. Yeah, and Sarah three years ago. So uh, there's, there's, uh, uh, and there's two from the uh, the, uh, the current uh, class. So quite a quite a uh, uh, a mix. Um, the uh, the topic today um, is part of a, a series of uh, of lectures that we've we've been doing uh, on Taiwan studies revisited. So in other words, what we've been trying to get authors to do is to um, look back uh, at their earlier work and look at how they view the, their, uh, their work maybe 10, 5 years after they were uh, published. And, and we, we had a number of um, papers in the, in the World Congress um, on, on, this, on this theme. And hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll eventually have a book on uh, Taiwan studies uh, revisited. Although, of course, um, it, it shows how I'm not listening to you because one of the, the early suggestions that Shelley uh, gave me when I was still doing my, my PhD was um, whatever you do, don't do edited volume. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm finding it really difficult to kind of get out of uh, this. And uh, this Taiwan studies revisited is one that has really kind of been almost imposed on me. I'm still um, trying to finish this. Um, um, a number of you have heard I'm doing this book on Taiwanese social movements, uh, which is drive, which I've been complaining about for, for two years. I was I was sending nagging emails this, this morning to my my uh, uh, unreliable authors. But okay, um, um, let's give um, uh, Shay a big um, uh, welcome back to to Soas. All right. Well, thank you very much. It is really a pleasure to be here and. Um, you know, to, to hear such a, a generous introduction from Dathith, whom I think of as absolutely, you know, the leader in our field, and to follow Nathan Bato, who is another person whose expertise and breadth of knowledge and methodological um, capabilities, I would, I would hope in a future life to be able to match these guys. So, um, you know, if I have some kind of position in the field, it's only by virtue of having got there early um, and uh, being followed by some really fantastic people. And I also am thinking about how much I envy your opportunity to be here at a center for Taiwan studies and to be taught, first of all, by such excellent people and to have the opportunity to hear these lectures, you know, people from all over the world. Tomorrow it's uh, Huang Changli. Uh, you know, nobody ever comes to Southern North Carolina in the USA <laughs> to talk about Taiwan. So um, I'm kind of in heaven right now. Um, I've been talking about Taiwan for the last four days and it's pretty fantastic. Um, so I thought I would, I would say a little something about kind of four issues tonight. And because many of you have some familiarity with this book, I don't want to talk too long. I really want mostly to have conversation. And I'm standing up not because I'm giving a lecture or I have a PowerPoint or anything, but you could probably like roll the space bar up so it's not my picture. <laughs> <laughs> Although I look pretty young in that picture, so maybe it's really young. <laughs> um, 
but I did want to just touch on these four things. First of all, just uh, kind of technical issues related to this book, how the demands of publishing shaped the book that uh, I actually ended up writing. And then secondly, some ruminations on history and how uh, this book changes, rereading this book changes how I think about Taiwan politics today. Uh, and then some thoughts about change in Taiwan and then just a few things that I think of as unanswered questions from this book. And I hope that that's really one of the things that we will definitely talk about is what you all see as the sort of research program, research agenda in the present um, following on the kind of literature that we were producing in the late 1990s, early 2000s. So first of all, I would say it's, okay, Daphne, you've, you've already told them that I gave you good advice once, which you didn't take. <laughs> so now I give you some more good advice, which some of you might take, which is if you have to read your old work, have a cocktail first, because it's <laughs> really painful. And we hardly ever do it, and it's cringing. Like page five, right? On page five, I get the date of the foundation of the Qing Dynasty wrong. <laughs> Lose my credibility with my readership from page five, you know, by some dumb thing which I could have checked on Wikipedia, except that this book was written before Wikipedia. <laughs> That's how old it is. So, you know, we don't like to read our own old work because all we see are the flaws. And we don't like to read other people's old work because it seems like a waste of time. You know, there's so much new stuff every day. I can't keep up, so why would I go back and read old things? Um, but it is incredibly eye-opening to see how we revise history in light of the present or the more recent past. Uh, you know, I read this book and I'm reminded, oh yeah, the TSU came out of KMT. Oh yeah, Li Donghui wrote the National Unification Guidelines. <laughs> oh my gosh, in 2000, Chen Shui-bian was the pro-China candidate. <laughs> you know, so all of these things that, we, that, that seem so incredible today are actual historical facts, which can be found in ancient tomes like this one. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, the retrospect, and especially this kind of compressed retrospection that we're doing in the 21st century when history is moving at such a rapid pace that it's, that if things are old, they're like, uh, uh, they're ontologically old. They're old in our knowing and being, but they're not very many years old. So it's strange. You know, it used to be that, that it took 100 years for there to be enough change accumulated for a historian to really digest it. Now, in just a short amount of time, we can get really um, confused and displaced from uh, historical reality. So retrospect seems to kind of smooth history out and impose this linearity and consistency on the past that was not actually present. So things begin to look like they were part of a long-term plan as opposed to having been the product of, you know, so it's that sort of, yes, the trajectory is like this, but at the time, all we see is the ups and downs. We, only in, in looking backwards can we see the, the linear change. And I guess that's an incredibly trite point to make, especially at SOAS, which is full of serious people, uh, many historians who well understand this, but um, you know, to a political scientist who's like reading the newspaper every day, uh, it seems like some kind of worthy statement to make. And I do think it's worth keeping in mind because what we are doing right now is making inferences about the future based on inferences we are making about the past without actually revisiting the past because we think we remember it because it was just a few years ago. And I'm thinking very specifically about Tsai Ing-wen. There are all of these things we think we know about Tsai Ing-wen and the smart people say, well, here's how we know how Tsai Ing-wen thinks because 
she worked for Li Donghui. She was an architect of the uh, Liang Guolun. But then if we go back and we look at what the Liang Guolun was when Li Donghui was asking people like Taiwan to be the architects of it, we realize we have made a, we have made an, a dangerous inference about who Taiwan is based on what Li Donghui became long after Liang Guolun, long after um, the National Unification Guidelines and all these other things. So, you know, if, if, if in fact Li Donghui was not a Taiwan independence fanatic all along, then what does it say about Tsai Ing-wen? How does that reshape our perceptions? And so, you know, obviously I'm mostly thinking about how Tsai Ing-wen is characterized in the mainland and the kind of very presentist uh, characterization of her that is made routinely by PRC leaders and scholars. Um, but I think we all can, or certainly maybe the rest of you all do a better job, but I need to watch out for that, um, that kind of thing. So just to say that there's a lot of false memory syndrome in the study of Taiwan politics. We, comp we, we act as if um, <coughs> there was a golden age of cross-strait relations back in the days when the KMT was in charge and everything was fine. And then uh, uh, people like Chen Shui-bian or DPP, you know, they come in, they start with this Taiwan independence stuff, and the next thing you know, cross-strait relations is really bad. Well, if you were alive in Taiwan between 1949 and 1987, you know that is complete nonsense. If there's a golden age of cross-strait relations, it's probably 2000 to 2012. But again, you know, it's so easy to kind of fall into these narratives and to forget what really happened. Um, And I think somehow, and maybe this is just because I've you know, just been reviewing this book for the purpose of this <laughs> event, but I think our perspective in the late 90s is maybe a little bit less reductionist than, than what we're using now. Um, and in this book, one of the things that I'm not cringing about is I find that it is surprisingly resistant to some of the binaries that have become really, really overwhelming in kind of ordinary discourse about Taiwan studies today. Very complexified in scholarly discourse, but very oversimplified in a kind of ordinary and po certainly political discourse. So binaries like independence versus unification, I actually did a pretty good job of deconstructing that in the book. I was kind of pleasantly surprised, honestly. <laughs> Um, and then the whole idea of national identity, you know, that if we take seriously what people were saying and doing when they were saying and doing these things, um, then we can see that, the, that history was much less linear, much less sort of predetermined than looking backwards at it um, tends to make us believe. So that's just a, some thoughts about History. Some thoughts about this technical issues, you know, how, how the demands of publishing shape the book that you actually end up writing. So politics in Taiwan was trying to do several things. One thing it was trying to do, and this is very important, was trying to turn a dissertation into a book. And it was trying to turn a dissertation on clientelism in local elections in 1985 and 1989 into a book that anyone would actually want to read. <laughs> and maybe today you could write a book on clientelism in local elections, but back in the late 1990s, I mean, I had advice from serious people. Oh. So how did, I get, how did I get it to be a person writing about Taiwan in the first place, right? I did some stuff in undergraduate that took me to Taiwan, and I had a great experience, and I really loved it. I was actually 
I wrote a, a senior thesis on uh, the ROC policy toward Yuan Zhumin. This was in 1984. Uh, so we didn't even have the word Yuan Zhumin then. Right? Um, so that was sort of step one. But then I thought, well, OK, so if I go to graduate school, I'm going to study real China. So I get to graduate school and I took a wonderful seminar from a wonderful scholar, great teacher, Drew Gladney, on uh, the politics of Islamic minorities in the mainland. And I said, this is what I want to do. Because already, I've already been studying uh, minorities in Taiwan. Now I can take this and I can do uh, Islamic minorities in the mainland. And I was writing up my prospectus for this <laughs> dissertation in the spring of 1989. So around June 5th, my advisor called me in and said, you know, that's a dissertation that's not happening. Not now, and we don't know when it will ever happen. That was a risky topic before June 4th, 1989. Now it is an impossible topic. So either you got to come up with something else. Well, you got to come up with something else. <laughs> So somebody said, and actually that somebody was another wonderful scholar and great person giving advice, um, which I did take, uh, <laughs> Stefan Haggard. And Stefan Haggard said, you know, Taiwan is on the radar for political scientists who are studying democratization. And it's a, you've already been there. You, you could go. You could do this. It'd be a happy story. It'd be fun to do. We would like to know. And you'd be out of here. You know, or you can hang around waiting for China to reopen. And it actually reopened really quickly, but we didn't think that um, in the spring of 1989. So that's how I end up in Taiwan, writing this dissertation on clientelism in local elections in 1985. Actually, not even, just four Xian Shizhang elections in 1985 and 1989. Um, so at that time, the strategy was get the book out, and get a topic about real China and work on that. Because in 10 more years, no one's going to care about Taiwan. So I'm waiting for no one to care about Taiwan so that I can move on to my topic about real China. Um, but I'm not optimistic that this is going to happen before my retirement. So I may turn out to be a lifer in the Taiwan field. Um, so anyway, I got this dissertation on this totally narrow topic that totally nobody cares about. Got to turn it into a book. And so a lot of what you read in here is this kind of odd mixture. And it's an odd mixture because there are chapters that are dissertation chapters about the, the uh, minutia of local politics in Taiwan. And then there are chapters that are trying to do the second thing, the second goal of this book, which was just to tell the story of Taiwan's democratization, just to give you something that you could read that would get you from 1972-ish to 1996. The book starts with Li Donghui's election victory. And it actually goes a little bit longer in a kind of epilogue that covers, in somewhat less detail, the uh, Li Donghui's presidency from 96 to sometime in 1998. Because the book came out in 99, so clearly I stopped writing it well before that. Now, another recommendation, if you know anybody in the market for a book topic, <laughs> this book for Korea. Because I teach Korean politics, and I have never found a book, a, a single authored book that is accessible to undergraduates that just tells the story of Korean democratization. So that's just a side note, if you are in the market for a project. So, okay, uh, turn my dissertation into a book. Tell the story of Taiwan's democratization. And then, of course, because it has to be political science, I have to explain Taiwan's democratization. I have to find some theory to drag into this great story. And in many ways, that's the least interesting part of the whole project, is trying to find some theoretical perspective that can animate what is already a tremendously lively subject. Uh, and I didn't, at the time, think, and I, and I think now even more, that the whole sort of transitology, you know, trying to explain democratization is not all that helpful. 
Um, because democratization, it seems, is so complex and has so many different causal elements, some of which are present in many cases, but none of which are sort of the necessary and sufficient cases for democratization everywhere. So I wasn't really sure um, how helpful this would be, but I found a theory that I thought could add something to the Taiwan story and that could sort of organize the Taiwan story while acknowledging how complicated democratization is and leaving room for sort of structural, individual, social, economic, developmental variables. And so elections become a kind of intervening variable or mechanism through which all of these other things can manifest toward a more democratic political system. Um, so it's not a full on theory. It's more an explanation that leans or glances back toward grand theories of democratization. Um, and maybe says less about why Taiwan democratized than about, less about why it democratized and more about how it democratized or why this particular way of democratization is what we saw in Taiwan. Another observation about the sort of technical side of the book is that it's, it's totally qualitative. It's based on field research and secondary sources. The field research is from the dissertation. The secondary sources tell the rest of the story, right? Occasionally, somebody would tell me something that I could put in another chapter that wasn't about SNTV. Here's another thing I really regret about this book. Why the hell didn't I use SNTV? What is with SVMM? Mm. <laughs> Who advised me to use an acronym that no one else ever used before or since? <laughs> Luckily, I can't remember, so I can't blame anyone. Um, and what I think about that now is it's not like the studies that we read about Taiwan elections today. Very few studies of Taiwan elections today use this kind of completely qualitative approach. And I am, you know, I am as much a, an admirer of science as the next sort of math phobic um, pretender. But I have to wonder, what are we missing? by not doing this kind of work more. You know, what, how do we know what question we didn't ask if we're always asking the same questions because we're using surveys? And I know that that oversimplifies, oversimplifies surveys a lot. And I know that there are a lot of people who are struggling in very creative ways with how to kind of dredge out the new topics that require measurement. But you know, I think that's, that is a virtue, uh, if, if you will, of a qualitative study is that it misses different things, maybe, than a, a quantitative study would miss. Um, and it raises the question then, looking back at it from, from the methodological perspective, of how much remains the same but is not visible to us because we're not looking for those things anymore. And I know that there are people who are um, looking for things, but I think we see a lot of, we might see more continuity if we kept using a multi-methodological approach. Um, the third topic I wanted to say a little bit about is just change in Taiwan. Another thing that I think you really, I feel very strongly looking back at this book is the, the just unbelievable pace of change. And my friends in Taiwan so often they're so frustrated, you know, like, why haven't we got whatever the goal is yet? But when you step in from outside, you know, every year, a couple times every year, every year or two, you just say, wow, I can't believe how fast this process is moving. So politics in Taiwan came out in 1999, and it basically ends with the election, or the re-election, if you will, but really the election for the first time of Li Dunhui in 1996. The second book came out two years later in 2001, and it's about Chen Shui-bian. It starts with the election of Chen Shui-bian. So they both start with an election night rally, um, four years apart, 
the books only come out two years apart, but what an incredible transformation of Taiwan. In politics in Taiwan, you do not see the DPP coming to power. And again, more advice. <laughs> so who had the idea to write a book about DPP? Who gets credit for having this idea? Well, I get credit for having this idea. <laughs> who gets credit for this idea? A guy at a foundation who called me up and he said, we want to fund a pro we want to fund some research on Taiwan. This is like a conservative foundation in the US and they're interested in Taiwan because it's anti-communist. <laughs> so we want to fund some research on Taiwan. You got have you got any ideas for projects? And so, oh yeah, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do that. He says, those are great, great ideas. Definitely write up some proposals for those. But just, you know, at the same time, think about this. So that's when you know, and here's the advice. That's how you know that that's what he's going to fund, is the thing he's about to say right now, is the one that the money is for. And he said, what about the DPP? We're, and this is about 1990, it had to be 1996, because I took leave in 1999, in the fall of 99. So this is 96, 97. He says, we're, we are very interested in the DPP. We want to know what's coming. We want to know what their, what their ideas are, what their plans are, what their prospects are, who the people are that we should be watching. So, you know, if you think you might want to do something like that. So, this foundation had the idea to study the DPP. And the, the DPP book came out first as a website for journalists who are going to cover the 2000 election. And then Chen Shui Lian won the 2000 election, and the publishers call me up. You know, Lynn Reiner herself calls me up and says, Can we publish your book? <laughs> so, again, take advice from people. They're trying to help you. <laughs> so, you know, that's just incredible change. And I think um, that where we can see this change in a number of places. You know, just, just reading politics in Taiwan, the, the areas of change that really strike me are the massive changes in institutions um, from even the late 1990s to the present. SNTV, aka SVMM, <laughs> SNTV produced a whole cottage industry of scholarship explaining what are the, con the political consequences of this institutional choice? So when Taiwan got rid of SNTV, I was kind of wistful, you know? I definitely, the book suggests that you should get rid of it if you, if you want, like, big boy politics. But I, I thought, I liked all that stuff, you know? I like that Gary Cox going into detail about... <laughs> So now, but now we can write about what are the consequences of getting rid of SNTV and what are the consequences of the new system and all that stuff. So institutions have changed. Politics have changed so much. The DPP is mainstream and beyond mainstream right now. It's the, it's the ruling party for real. So the whole time that Chen Shui Bian's in power, you're having to explain to people, it's the ruling party, but it's not really the ruling party because it doesn't control the legislature and, you know, it's just complicated. So, you know, the, the title of that book should have been From Opposition to Sort of Power and Back Again. <laughs> um, but now we're back, and this time they really are in power, and that's really amazing, um, you know, in such a short time. Another thing that has changed enormously are kind of norms and expectations. You know, what people would tolerate. When you read the report about um, public opinion on issues like tolerance for authoritarianism or single party government, party image. We were talking about this earlier with Nathan, you know, that the ideas that uh, people in Taiwan held toward political topics were very different in the 1990s than they are today, but also, you know, the, the, these changes have been really marked. And then finally, and this was where I got in just under the wire, uh, the quantity and quality of available scholarship on many issues. So you read this book and you think, this is not very well sourced. Like there's this section on uh, the Japanese colonial era, like politics in Taiwan in the Japanese colonial era. It's got like three sources. And people could look at that now and say, seriously, why didn't you do any research? 
And the answer is that's what there was in 1991, 92, 93 when I was writing that. You know, there, there wasn't, historians hadn't really done their thing yet. And, you know, I could have known, like it was known that the Qing Dynasty didn't start in 1664, but um, a lot of the other stuff that we know now was was really not excavated yet. So the, the quality and quantity of scholarship that's available on so many issues uh, would have made for, I would say, a very different book in, you know, today from what I was able to put together in the late 90s. Um, things that we know have changed in Taiwan, uh, party identification, like people have it now. Still, I think a plurality would say no, no preference for either party or, but, it, but uh, you know, there's a lot more party identification than there used to be and there's much more clear understanding of what parties stand for. Um, and even people now today know when parties are making something up, you know, when they're changing their positions, that people can recognize it. So these party uh, images are more uh, real and durable and less manipulable than they were back in the 90s. I think also uh, national identity is, is makes a lot more sense to talk about national identity in the 2000s than in the 19. 90s. Um, and, and one of the reasons was just in the 90s, survey research was so new and the environment, the sort of authoritarian environment was still so recent that people were in a different mindset about how to answer a question like that. But also people were still, you know, living in a, a, an era of sort of hegemonic narratives about history that made it hard for them to answer questions about national identity without reference to their education or the sort of norms of the society. So uh, that's pretty interesting to me. Um, and I also, looking back here, it's so interesting. It, it turns out that at first, the KMT got all the credit for democratization in Taiwan. And remember, you know, Li Donghui was Mr. Democracy. And at first, democratization really strengthened the KMT um, for two reasons. One, they got credit for it, and that was intentional. Mr. Democracy was doing that on purpose. But also because democratization helped to indigenize KMT, right? Um, and that was really in some ways at its peak, and I think that's why in this book I can fail to see the KMT's successful management of democratization eventually falling apart. Because at this moment, in the late 1990s, they own democratization. Lee Dunhui is the man. Um, but that didn't last. Uh, you know, the divergent goals and interests within the KMT eventually led, most recently, right, just within the last uh, couple years, to breakup and implosion. And now we look at the KMT and we think, wow. Um, but it is very interesting to be reminded how much strength the KMT could command in elections not so very long ago that, you know, they really, they had the system down. So I think, you know, that really recommends now moving to the unanswered questions. Uh, you know, we, we really need to understand the arc of the KMT since 2000. What happened that caused the KMT to, you know, 去本土化, right? and lose its ability to be the, the even, not only just lose its ability to be the sort of the architect of democratization, but even to lose its ability to be creditable as a democratic force in, in Taiwan. You know, I fear that that's kind of how it feels at the moment to a lot of people, and that's a huge, huge change. So that's one area of study. Uh, I also think um, 
you know, how voting has changed. We have such sophisticated models now that can link demographic and ideological variables to electoral outcomes, but have those, and, and this is really a question, have those ways of understanding voting come at the expense of the organizational factors in voting? Are we still paying attention, in other words, to the ground game that different uh, parties have and, and parties within parties, factions within factions? Um, do we know how reform has changed behavior relative to all of the other drivers? You know, so I'm thinking institutional reform, electoral reform. How has that changed behavior relative to all the other drivers that are changing behavior? We don't know. Um, and while as a political scientist with this emphasis on scientist, I am definitely a lightweight, I still want to say, you know, um, one thing qualitative research does for us is it gives us ideas for what to look at next. And after all these years of studying national identity, what will we do when there's no longer variation on that variable? If you look at certain demographic groups in Taiwan, there is basically uniform attachment to Taiwanese identity. So thinking about young people. So that can't be an explanatory variable because there is no, there's not enough variation. So what are you going to do with that, right? How do we move past the sort of paradigm that we've been living within for the last 15 to 20 years? So maybe um, the, uh, maybe the qualitative method that's used here has some value in helping us move in that direction. And I feel like, just my final point, the, the impetus for that kind of work will come out of an interdisciplinary program like this one. You know, your training to look at things holistically will enable you to ask questions that are not necessarily already packaged for your uh, analytical attention. And we may, be, we may be in need of that pretty soon. So that's what I wanted to say. And I hope I've not gone on too long anyway. We can have some conversation. Great, thanks for that, uh, uh, Shelley. Yeah, well, I completely agree with your point on the way that the um, uh, the kind of the publication market has uh, has, has changed. Um, for both of us, our, our first book was kind of was a kind of a PhD transition, but um, uh, my one was much um, uh, a more direct transition. I think uh, I think I spent maybe three weeks <laughs> uh, doing the um, uh, the transition between the uh, uh, the the two. I mean, I did have to change. Uh, I had, maybe I had to add an updated chapter. Uh, I had to kind of um, cut some of those kind of section headings. Um, but th I think three weeks is, is it says something about I mean um, um, about how it was possible to have a very kind of uh, probably in two thousand and four you could have published your original dissertation, mm -hmm. which, uh, um, and. It, um, can Shelley kind of give us a sense of that in, in one of her, her, write, her essays on the state of the field on Taiwan politics? And one of the things that comes out of that, we often look at that in the, the first week of our courses, um, the, the way there's been a, such an expansion in the number of publications um, uh, on, on Taiwan in, in a range of, of, of fields. Now, one of the things I've been asking people on this um, uh, revisited theme to, to think about was the reviews. Um, what were the... Um, uh, reviews like um, when your book first came out, and, uh, and uh, we, we often find this, uh, we often can be quite kind of sensitive to these reviews, but um, um, I, mean, uh, I actually think a lot of those reviews, critical reviews of my first book at, at, at the time were actually right when I re-look at them now. How, how are your reviews? So here's 
how much of a chicken I am. <laughs> I, I honestly couldn't tell you. <laughs> I'm not sure anybody reviewed this book, actually. Has anybody ever read a review of this book? There must be loads. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I never went back and looked for that. Mm. I was like, on to the next thing. I was writing about the DPP. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, look, I mean, nowadays, actually getting, getting journals to review books on Taiwan is a little bit more challenging because there are just so many more uh, books. But in those days, um, uh, I think it would, would, would have been quite different. Um, I suppose another question that I'm a bit curious about is, um, how did your methods change uh, after the, uh, the first book? Because once you get into academic uh, life, it's much more difficult to do that kind of in-depth uh, field work. Um, I wonder how you found this. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a serious issue for uh, anyone, I think, who's, who's specializing in a country not her own, uh, where you don't live. Um, so this book was the product of one full year of field research in Taiwan, plus a lot more than three weeks of other stuff. Um, but I was in Taiwan from January to December of 1991. And that's where the dissertation research came from. So that was a very leisurely process, actually. Um, the first person I met who opened every door, the only reason any of this is here, is thanks to Chen Ju. Uh, and I got to meet Chen Ju because I had connected with someone from the Human Rights Watch in the US. Because at this time, you know, Taiwan's still kind of on the margin. So, I went to see Human Rights Watch and I said, you know, is there anything I can do for you? Is there information that I could gather for you while I'm there? And um, they said, go see the Taiwan Association for Human Rights and see how they are. And I don't think that they ever imagined I would do anything for them. I think they knew what they were doing for me when they made that recommendation. But it was on their, their invitation that I was able to secure a meeting with Chen Ju. And it was like I was a member of her tribe immediately. She was so generous with her, you know, like dinners and hanging out at their office with young Taiwanese social movement activists. But also, she introduced me to everybody all of the DPP candidates that I needed to study, who were the DPP candidates from the 1985 and 89 uh, Xianxiang elections in Taipei Xian, Xinzhu Shi, uh, Tainan Xian, and Kaohsiung Xian. So all those people, the doors just pop open when, and at that time I was so ignorant. I didn't even know why they were all so willing to do anything for me because I came with Chen Ju's endorsement. Now, of course, I realize, oh my gosh, she was their martyr, their hero, their most, you know, the most beloved person. Um, but I was just like, yeah, mm, I'm wandering around, banging into things for a year. <laughs> but over the course of it, managed to, you know, collect enough information um, to do this. But at that time, I could do things like uh, Li Zongfan was the uh, DPP candidate in Tainan Xian in 1985. And uh, he, he, people from his office would say things like, get on the train at, uh, get on the two o'clock train, you know, the Ju Guang Hao, to uh, Tainan Shi, and there's a guy going to pick you up there. And he's going to show you around for a while, meet some people. So, like, I would pack a bag for a lot of days and just go down, get off the train. It wasn't hard to know which one was me. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> somebody pulls up and the, the window on the, on the passenger side goes down, the head comes out, are you Dr. Shelley? So then we would get in the car and just go around. This happened in, in Tainan Xian and Kaohsiung Xian and also Xinzhu. Xinzhu. Um, and we, they, I mean, I didn't know where I was sleeping. I didn't know where I was eating. I didn't know who the next person was that I was going to talk to. I didn't know who was driving and where we were going. And But every single one of those people was so generous and hospitable. 
and we so we this is how you know this is I guess what snowballing is in in you know research methods. What it really means is don't be afraid to get in the car with a complete stranger <laughs> and spend the night at his house. If that's what you're doing, that's what you're doing, and it's totally fine. So I got a lot of information that way. And the other thing that I have to say that I really admired about those people was they took me to KMT as well as DPP. Mm -hmm. oh. So the thing that really made my dissertation um, work was the discovery of this political strategy called Tiawaka. <laughs> and I never heard of Tiawaka. I never heard of Duan Jiao. Probably I'm reading newspapers in that big newspaper room in the central library and I see some phrase and I look it up and it doesn't make sense so I just go right over it. Zhuang Jiao. Should we talk about Zhuang Jiao? Okay, I don't need this. I can get the gist of this article. But I was sitting, it was, at a, it was with a guy from the Jiu Guo Tuan in uh, like Alian Xian in Kaohsiung Xian or Alian, Alian Xiang. And he's going on and on and on. He's like, you know, we're speaking in, in Mandarin, but he keeps saying, Tiawaka, Tiawaka. And finally I said, could you, what is Tiawaka? <laughs> and then the, the, him and the DPP guy who took me there both oh. get this look like, uh-oh. Somebody told her the secret code. Now she knows. <laughs> now she knows. So then everywhere I went, the, I stopped asking all these sort of uh, superficial questions mm. that I had been asking. And then I'm like, all right, talk to me about Tiawaka. And as soon as I had the magic word, then they just had to talk about that a lot. So that takes time. That requires having the leisure to be wrong, to be slow, to go back again and again and again. Um, and once you have a job teaching in the United States or in the UK, it's really hard to do that ever again. And it changes your research method so you become much more reliant on, uh, well, you know, quantitative information that you can access from anywhere and mess with um, in your desktop. But for me, more, it has, because that's never going to be me, I'm never going to be Nathan Bato um, messing with data in my desktop. And that's a good thing. You don't want me too close to data. Um, but what it really changed for me was my choice of topics mm -hmm. and the research topics that I can pursue. So the DPP was also heavily based on field research, but that was because that, that foundation yeah. happened to give me a grant at a time when I could extricate myself. And they gave me enough money to buy myself out of teaching for a semester. So I went to Taiwan. But then that project, I only had a summer. So I had to be, I had to get it right the first time. I had to have a schedule. I had to go from place to place to place to place to place. So I got a research assistant, uh, Jesse Lan, and uh, he went with me to make sure that I didn't miss anything. And he helped me out a lot. Like um, he said, do you notice how they all, so this is interviewing mostly senior DPP figures. Do you notice how they all change their body language when you ask about generational turnover? And I said, no, actually, I'm so desperate to take notes and understand and like make sure that I've written down what I didn't understand so I can ask you later, that I did not notice that their body language changes. And he says, they hate that question. They don't think they're old. They're not, in their own mind, they're not the senior generation. So, you know, I was already with that project depending on um, other kinds of resources than just myself to, to get it done efficiently enough. Um, and then why Taiwan matters is that is the product of every interaction I have ever had, every question I have ever asked, every person I have ever met in Taiwan since the first time I went, which was in 1982. Uh, so that's really more like, less like research, although of course you have to look a lot of things up, and more like putting together everything you know. And that's not permissible in scholarly work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a book for general readers because that's where you can tell stories that don't have any theory, that, that might not even all the time be exactly true the way you said you'd like to remember them. But I am pretty sure about that night in Hualien in 1982, 
when all those little kids were sleeping on the marble coffee tables of that house, which again, you know, I didn't know who those people were, why we were sleeping there, who those kids were, they were sleeping on the marble coffee tops, but they make the coffee tables, but they make it into the book too, because it's, you know, it's all that color. So um, <laughs> that's the kind of stuff that I can do now, but more and more and more, I have to do um, policy related work because that's what people will pay me to go to Taiwan to do is something that is somehow policy relevant and that's sort of sweeping together a lot of things. So it's changed my method to be a grown up tied to a job. Tied to a job is bad enough, but tied to, you know, two little kids um, is actually great because they're pretty flexible and uh, they went with me to for a semester in Taiwan and a semester in China when my children were four and eight years old and they they went to local school and and sur you know they were good sports but still it, it makes it much more difficult so that opportunity for that massive amount of soaking and poking was a one-time thing I think would like to start with some uh, questions. <laughs> um, okay, go ahead. Hello. Uh, hello, uh, hello. Uh, thank you for your speech. That's really fascinating. That was very fascinating. And I am a PhD student of gender studies here. And um, uh, in light of your speech, I would like to ask Ashley. Um, during your research on Taiwan, would you find anything that particular elements that are really different from the elements you could found in the West that could actually reconfigure the whole theory of democracy? Um, that's my first question. And actually, I, I can tell that from your study, uh, basically you are addressing the conceptualization of democracy with mainly reference to voting and election. But um, of course, it was really uh, is it is a key element in democracy. But now, um, after 20, 30 years of democracy, I would say Taiwan now, the problems in relation to democracy is not just about election, but more about how we can actually have informed electorate, informed citizens, informed citizens who are able to discuss multiple um, public issues with intelligence and with tolerance of different opinions. And yeah, I want to see your opinions on it. Yeah. Um, that's one of the reasons why I think the democratization literature is kind of useful, you know, but limited and limited in, in time because it really was focused on the installation of an electoral system that is pretty open, but it, it really doesn't, you know, if you think about the, the people who um, drove that literature, they really were not very interested in those deeper questions about uh, they might say something like, you know, Huntington talks about the, the media needs to be reasonably free. But what does that mean? You know, if, what if the media is too free? And, you know, I turn on my TV and there's 700 channels, and that's how many channels there are on my TV, which is why I don't watch TV, because I can't find anything to watch on 700 channels. Do me. But um, I watch something that's not edifying, that's not informative, that's not educational, that does not improve me. So it's free, but it's not really helping democracy. And I mean, in the United States right now, you know, obviously, you know, we're so, we're in so much trouble because we haven't paid attention to the quality of our democracy. And what we also haven't paid attention to is the, the way that the economic system does or does not support democracy. And the way that uh, decisions you make about 
how your democracy is going to work interact with economic factors to give you a better or a worse democracy. So, you know, I think in some ways Taiwan is in a better position because your or their that democracy is young enough to not have already decided that all that everything is perfect the way it is. Whereas in the United States, you know, if you try to if you say, look, the way we are financing our elections is destroying our democracy. Oh, you're just anti-American. You know what's wrong with you? <laughs> so, you know, in, in some ways, I think that what we what we know is that democracy is a really is a moving target. And another person that I I can't praise highly enough, or maybe I can, but I probably won't, is Ed Friedman. Ed Friedman is a really smart guy. Um, and he is constantly saying things that I, that I can't forget. And one of them he said to me was, I was talking about democratic consolidation, you know, like I, 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 I read a book, so now I'm talking. <laughs> and he said, democracy is never consolidated. What does that mean? <laughs> democracy is always in peril, always in process, in progress, always <clears throat> in flux. You know, you don't reach the Emerald City, and then everything is fine for all eternity. And I think that's a really helpful corrective. And so, you know, like, how does, how does my, how do these thoughts reconfigure my understanding of democracy? Well, they make me a whole lot more respectful of the complexity and the fragility of democratic institutions and, and life in a democracy. Yeah, be you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's fascinating, especially when you, when you start the talk, actually compare. You're more or less uh, looking back at the book and uh, compare uh, or examining what not probably not good enough or sometimes actually it's good in the long run. You can tell what's good about it. And, uh, but then you made some comments about the current situation. You said uh, the currently you can see some sort of binary discourses and a certain kind of false memory syndrome. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? And uh, whether it's really to do with the, your, your, <laughs> your opinion on this so-called quality of dem uh, democracy, whether that's the case. Well, the false memory syndrome that <laughs> comes through to me most uh, when I when I think about Li Denghui, because and you know, this is a room full of people who actually know something about Taiwan, so you're not as susceptible to the false memory syndrome as most of the people I deal with. But most of the people I deal with are honestly who who care about Taiwan, who like ask me to talk to them about Taiwan. They are mostly. Um, China specialists, and actually a lot of them are in China. I have a lot of interaction now with the China, the Taiwan studies community in Shanghai, mm -hmm. and also Xiamen and a little bit in Beijing, um, and US government officials. And all of these people would tell you that Li Donghui has been a Taidu Funza since the day he was born. <laughs> that he's a Japanese to his core, and that he's been plotting to destroy the KMT all his life. And I just think I don't I don't buy that. I mean I I just don't buy that. I'm I'm also old enough now to know that I have changed my own mind. And I think you know, most people become more conservative as they get older. I think Lee Dong-hui became less conservative. I think he became frustrated, and I think he be he saw his interests, and then he began to have some vision. But I don't think he started out as a Taidu Funza, working to undermine the, the KMT and bring down the ROC and destroy cross-strait relations. So, for example, uh, the two-state theory. Now we look back on it and we say, this is the beginning of the end of the golden age of cross-strait relations. 
that uh, in 1987, you know, Taiwanese start going to the mainland and they start to have some relationship. And then um, in 92, they send the old guys out to um, talk to each other and they reach a consensus. <laughs> And everything was fine until Li Donghui had to say, you know, two states theory. And then everything, everything flew apart. It's Li Donghui's fault that we, that we had, that, that the, the good progress in cross-strait relations was going on. And that, of course, helps with this completely dishonest reification of the 92 consensus. The 92... Something happened. I'm totally in agreement with, you know, with uh, Tsai Ing-wen. Something happened in 92 that allowed those guys to have their conversation. But the mythology around it that has been spun up <coughs> since, and also the labeling of it with a, a kind of mantra, this is a fetish. 92 consensus is a fetish that is shared by KMT and CCP and allows them to do things. And then to say, well, you can't do this with us because you don't share our fetish. <laughs> Which actually makes it sound a lot more fun than I know. <laughs> um, but if we go back to the late 1980s, what we see is, I, you know, I could find it, but I won't. Um, in this book, Jason Hu, Hu Chu mm -hmm. saying, in 1991, we decided to acknowledge the existence of the PRC, to end the civil war, to start talking to the other side, to get this thing going. And what was our platform? And this is not Jason Hu talking anymore. So what was the platform? The platform was ROC is going to go talk to PRC. And so they're expecting, they're hoping that they can have this dialogue, which will break decades of no recognition, no contact, no interaction, military confrontation, both sides spending so much to militarize this relationship, hoping that PRC will see the opportunity that's being put forward for them. And it's the PRC that says, you know, no. If you call yourself a state, then everything is, everything is off. So I don't think this is Li Donghui saying, Taiwan is a state, and it's not part of China. And it, it will negotiate with China to have direct links or something. I think it's Li Donghui looking for a way to get something going. And that has been completely erased in the sort of normal discourse about cross-strait relations. And, and so the 92 consensus can be this kind of fetish if we empty out what we should know about what it really meant at the time and, and how it, it's entirely possible that Li Donghui thought of Liang Guolun as a kind of embodiment of Zhou Er Gong Shi. Or, or, you know, kind of trying to state it a little bit more clearly. Then again, maybe Li Donghui was a Taidu Funza from the day he was born, and all the time a big conspiracy to separate Taiwan from China. The thing is, we will never know. Because when he gave the Chinese the opportunity to solve this problem, through the National Unification Guidelines, which remember the National Unification Guidelines are a Li Donghui product. The PRC brushed him away and said, we, not, we, we can't talk to you anymore. So that's the point at which the PRC cast its fate. Taiwan will go off in its own direction and, and because we refuse this offer, then, you know, we're going we're gonna to wake up in 30 years' time and say, whoa, this national identity thing has put us in a real bind. So it's stuff like that that I look back on and I say, wow, how, how far we, how ingrained these assumptions have become about what these people were doing that just are ahistorical, in my opinion. Can I carry on? <laughs> oh. Uh, um. Got a question at the back, and then we'll come back to you. Yes, um, just to uh, reconnect your um, 
answer with the question of the, uh, the gender study student. Um, what I think she was uh, referring to was uh, within new democratic spheres, the issue is not the democracy itself, but those issues of participation and those issues of enfranchisement which are continually being renewed, contested and challenged. What your answer revealed is that this is essentially an unending quest. It's not a situation we arrive at, but it isn't the real issue isn't so much democracy as it's being sold and as it's being bought and as it's being introduced, but how we actually challenge the institutions which underpin democratic forms. Because you mentioned in the States that you know you can't mention anything about those institutions until somebody tells you how un-American you are. I mean, the same is true in, in the UK. I, I mean, you probably don't know this, but there was uh, uh, recently an exhibition in the Barbican in which it was depict, uh, purportedly depicting uh, in slavery, and they, were, they imported a white South African curator to enclose black people as an art exhibition. Of course, the black population objected to this, and they demonstrated on the streets, and eventually the Barbican had to back down and close the exhibition down before it was even uh, uh, issued. And one of the reasons that they cited was that they, there was a threat to public uh, well-being and welfare, but they were concerned about freedom of speech. I mean, how could we uh, understand freedom of speech in the black community when th this country and the US and other countries were actually supporting apartheid, and so we now import apartheid personnel to do the same thing as art, and yet we understand this in democratic forms. So for me, the real problem is not so much how we import or export democracy, but how we actually check and balance our institutions, because our institutions are never democratic. In England, we have never elected a government since the war with a majority of the people. Every government we've had in England in the post-war period has been elected by a minority of the voting public. You know, would people in Taiwan or China understand this? They would think that, you know, we're the model of democracy. Yeah, yeah, it's, it is a process. I think that's, that's your key insight. Um, and we, I think one of the things that has been sort of controversial in the study of um, democratization of Taiwan, which, like, it seems dumb that it was controversial at one time, although there are people still having this fight, <coughs> is what was, what was Zhang Jinghua's role in Taiwan's democratization? Did Zhang Jinghua give permission? Did he um, drive the boat? Was he the impetus? Was he an obstacle? And if you say, you know, I think Zhang Jingguo made some good decisions, then certain people will, oh, you're not, not allowed to say anything good about Zhang Jingguo. But what has often been missing from the sort of the modernization theory direction kinds of um, democratization, transitology literature, from the top-down individual, you know, what Zhang Jingguo did, one thing that had to fight hard to get back into this narrative is the social movements. Mm -hmm. And in particular, and, and I think because the, the social movements in Taiwan were also political movements, and they were so disciplined at one time. Someone asked me to review Lu Xiulian's autobiography, and I thought, oh, really? <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to review Lu Xiulian's autobiography? But I thought, yeah, I guess I, I guess I should, because a lot of times, more advice for budding scholars, <laughs> you do, you accept uh, the, the request to review a book or an article because it's something you need to read that you wouldn't read otherwise. <laughs> I am so glad I read Lucio Lian's autobiography because it's really interesting and it's really fun. And one of the things that she says in there is, basically, there were a lot of sexist men in the democratic movement. And I was a feminist, a feminist activist. That was my primary objective. And you know what I did? I swallowed my frustration and I worked with those guys because I wanted to win. And that is a cool reminder. And how many different interests were swallowed in order to pursue this 
primary goal. So another thing that I like in this book is that I don't say that the, the opposition movement was an independence movement. I say they were pushing for democracy and ethnic justice. They wanted fairness for Taiwanese people. Independence, national identity, all those things came later, but the real driver in the first instance was freedom and justice and participation. So the so I think a lot of that a lot of the energy that was in social movements kind of got channeled into the democratic movement. But now what we see when we look at Taiwan today is we see these movements resurging every time. You know, when it feels like the political class has kind of lost its connection to the society, mm -hmm. the society comes roaring back to demand that connection. So right now, something that a lot of people want to read about, in fact, um, even in the US government, is the uh, New Power Party. Because they see the new power party as possibly the next big thing in Taiwan and emerging out of these social movements. So I, I think that it is really important not to be so focused on elite politics and elections and all that stuff that we wait till it's too late to see this, you know, this big kraken coming up under the boat, you know, to, to turn us over. Uh, B, you want to come back? Yeah. Um, Thank you. Oh, I, I just wonder, um, the recent book, uh, Why Taiwan Matters, sort of uh, you draw all your um, decades of experience uh, into this book, very personal at some point, and I wonder whether you can elaborate a little bit about this. You were uh, describing uh, Taiwan's uh, identity crisis as a kind of negotiation between um, China's inside and China outside. Can you elaborate a bit more? that yeah, why so, it come from how it come yeah from. yeah so um, you know the meaning of China in Taiwan has changed so much and this is one of the um, one of the conundrums facing survey researchers and we were talking about this the other day you know we have this survey question it's been on surveys for a really long time are you Taiwanese Chinese or both and you have to keep asking that. You know, you have to keep watching that question because it's, it's indicative of something. But you also have to keep exploring what, is, what does it in fact indicate. And I think one of the things that changes the, the way that question is received and the, the meaning that that question and its answers have, one of the things that changes that over time is the changing definition of China. So, I don't know, did the Social Change Survey have a question like that in the 80s? Probably not. But the question comes early in the 90s, right? How far do your series go back for Taiwan, Taiwanese, Chinese, or both? 1992. Okay, so maybe 1992. Yeah. In 1992, the discourse of ROC is ubiquitous in Taiwan still, right? In 1991, some young kids got in trouble for going up to Japan to meet with Shuming. I remember that because they came back and they got arrested yeah. in, in Taipei. Meanwhile, by the end of that year, uh, Wu Fi was planting flags down the middle of Zhongxiaodong Lu, and this guy who was part of the plot to assassinate uh, Zhang Jingguo in New York was giving speeches. So it changed very fast. Um, but still, the, the discourse of ROC was ubiquitous in Taiwan. Everyone who was answering that question had come through an ROC education. And so when you ask them, are you Chinese, Taiwanese, or both, we know that ROC is, is inflecting their answer. You ask that question today, that people are not answering, am I ROC or Taiwanese? They're answering, seriously. <laughs> if I say I'm Chinese, does that make sense? <laughs> Have I ever been born in China? Did I grow up in China? Have I ever lived in China? Why would I call myself Chinese? Because why? Because the PRC has defined itself as the only China in the world. So from an external perspective, it makes no sense for people from Taiwan to call themselves Chinese because the PRC is China. 
And from an internal perspective, there's no longer this kind of, oh, I don't know, what should I say? How should I answer this question? Because on the one hand, I'm from Taiwan, and there's another child, but on the other hand, I'm ROC, and you know, shouldn't we? Now people just say, yeah, Taiwan, like they're over it. And I think that that's, that's not, that's some kind of change of identity, but it's also the ability to manifest something that's been there maybe much longer, but also it's just what is China? It used to be that Taiwan was China to itself. And now today, Taiwan is not China to itself. And we have to pay lip service to the ROC, but no one really struggles with that. Or maybe some people do. But Mind most you, people don't. don't. Mind you, <laughs> no, I think he's really actually very clear. He's Chinese. And what is China? ROC. Right. Okay. That's all. Um, one of the things that come, come, come out in your, in your talk was uh, change and, the, and, and the, the kind of scale of change. Um, so if you could actually go back and um, go back in time, would you change much in the way you handled the, um, the, the book? Hmm. <laughs> well, page five. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, there are embarrassing mistakes I would fix. But I would probably end up making other ones. Um, it's a little bit scattered. It feels un uneven in some ways. It feels a little lumpy to me, like maybe I would um, not say so much about so with the SVMM system. <laughs> um, or maybe a little bit less about electoral mobilization. I think, I, I think it would be maybe a better book if I had decided, is this a book about voting behavior, or is this a book about the story of Taiwan's democratic transition? You know, I want to go back to Bu's question, though, because I don't think I really, um, I said quite everything, because the, all, another dimension of the China inside and the China outside is that the first China, so the ROC was the original China against which Taiwanese um, activists were positioning themselves. And so they imagined that if they could do something about ROC, then they could have their freedom. And the, the, the ROC, the KMT, the Weishengren domination, this was the sort of package of things that they needed to overturn in order to be free. So that was, that was what China was, you know, so back in the, even in the 90s, you know, I, I remember we used to, we, foreigners, used to ask Taiwanese <laughs> friends, what do you think is going to be different if you get your independence? And they would say things like, they had, they had many good answers, but one was, if we get independence, then the KMT will have no reason to be an authoritarian ruling party because we won't be trying to do unification anymore. And so they will have to step aside and let Taiwanese govern Taiwanese. And so there's a, there's a period of time covered in the book where, where the issue is self-determination. That's what the DPP is pushing. So they were really focused on the KMT and the way that the KMT was blocking Taiwan from reaching its destiny. So I always think of it as like a prisoner, you know, you're in your cell and you dig out from your cell. And so the DPP, you know, the opposition movement is digging, 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 digging to get out. They finally get out and the KMT is no longer insisting on a single party authoritarian government. The KMT is no longer insisting on unification as the primary destiny of, of the Taiwan people. So they pop up into the, into the sunlight, we're free, and there's another fence <laughs> on the other side. You know, outside of the, in, the obstacles of the KMT, the ROC, the uh, Weishengren, is the PRC. And that 
is a much more formidable opponent, right? So that's the China outside. So first it's the China inside, and that animates one kind of movement. That movement, I think, totally succeeded. Taiwan became Taiwanized, democratized, and can make room for these social movements and all of this stuff, but you're still in prison because the next <coughs> phase cannot happen until you do, you do something about the PRC. And it turns out that changing KMT's mind was way easier <laughs> than changing CCP's mind. So that's really, in that chapter, the China inside is that one, and the China outside is the PRC. OK, in that case, then, I think we can um, continue our discussions over some sandwiches and, and, and wine. Um, yeah, well, it's quite rare that we had sandwiches. <laughs> so um, enjoy this, this special treat. Uh, and let's thank uh, Shelley and Nathan uh, one more time. Thank you.